you to all the people um, at the USC Institute for Global Health and the law school and the program on global health and human rights and the human rights clinic at Gould, and particularly to Libby and Larissa um, for the amazing work that you've done in, in getting this all together, and to Heather Ripley, who took me on this tour this morning, and Alex Nicholson, who's been my personal driver. <laughs> um, and honestly, after the tour that Heather took me on, I am so applying to become a student here um, in the film school. Um, I, I'm just, it's just the most remarkable place. As, as I say to Heather and Alex, I got such a sense of possibility everywhere I went this afternoon. And it's a very wonderful place, so thank you. What I'm going to quickly do um, with, with, if it's okay with all of you, is you're not going to be seeing the full feature version of the film, the 75 minute version, because we wanted to make it, we wanted time for questions and, and discussion at the end. So you're seeing the 52 minute version, so 25 minutes have been cut. It's a version that was made for television stations and for aeroplanes, dare I say. Um, it has been um, and so it's somewhat fragmented with apologies and so what I want to do is you'll still get a sense of the story very much but I thought I would frame it a little for you and draw out some of the things that, that I think um, you, might, you, might, you might not get um, from seeing it. The documentary in many ways um, seeks to give focus to a historical legacy easily forgotten, but still regrettably evident in South Africa. And also importantly, to the evolution of law as an agent that both entrenched and now seeks to transform state power. It is, in a sense, the visual analysis of a nation's disdain and subsequent and unimaginable, albeit ambivalent, respect for law's capacity, and of a very small community's engagement with law's promise. In the film of the novel, some of you might have read, Andre Brink's A Dry White Season, Marlon Brando plays a liberal white lawyer representing a black woman at the inquest of her husband, a victim of alleged suicide in a cell at the notorious John Forster police station in Johannesburg. And at the beginning of the inquest, Marlon Brando warns his client, justice and law are distant cousins, and here in South Africa, they are not even on speaking terms. When I took on the Uppington case, I'd been in practice as a lawyer for seven years, working mostly with trade unionists in South Africa, students, journalists, anti-party activists, members of the clergy. And we'd achieved some victories in the courts, and the application of harsh apartheid laws and state conduct may have been restrained as a result. Often, however, legal remedies remain symbolic, having little chance of enforcement. And the overriding scale of hardship and harm and the enormity of damaged lives endured, barely dented. These were the times when fatigue set in for us as lawyers and undid the optimism of triumph and I would silently side with Marlon Brando's character and doubt any familial ties at all between justice and the law. But as lawyers working with fragile communities damaged by law's impact, we learned that we had to ride the waves of legal opportunity to wait for the moment when the intimate facts of my clients' lives and the exterior forces might effectively combine to undermine the loathsome intent of law. When we could use the courts as sites of struggle and nudge, as the title of today's event suggests, even inch law towards justice. And the film you see is really a small example of that enterprise. It's a weaving of archival and more contemporary footage showing the trial of 25 black people accused of the murder of a black policeman who was a one-time friend of many of the accused. And they were convicted under the so-called common purpose doctrine, which I believe in American law is the <coughs> is called complicity, it's joint enterprise and complicity. The doctrine has, despite its notorious application in this context, does have legal utility and it's often used in a bank robbery situation where, say, three people come together to rob a bank, which is an unlawful enterprise, someone has a gun, and someone is shot in the melee of the robbery, and all three are then held equally liable for the murder. Um, however, this, in this instance, the doctrine was cruelly and disingenuously applied. 
To cast a net so wide so as to bring together and charge and convict 25 people who had absolutely no common enterprise. It was simply to criminalize their legitimate political protest. And as we mark this year, the 20th anniversary of South Africa's remarkable transition to a non-racial democracy, what is so unsettling for me is that the cycles of history recently saw the misapplication of this discredited doctrine appear again in the Lon Mine Mines Massacre. Some of you may know about the Marikana Mines Massacre in Johannesburg that happened um, two years ago, when police opened fire on striking miners at a platinum mine just outside Johannesburg killing 34 miners and injuring more than 70 others. And after, soon afterwards, approximately 270 miners were arrested and charged with the murder of the 34 miners who had been shot by the police under the common purpose doctrine. Um, it was very bizarre for me because I got all these phone calls from lawyers and, and researchers in South Africa saying, how can this be? How do you apply this, this weird doctrine in this case? And I'm happy to say that the National Prosecuting Authority, as a consequence of advocacy from community groups and lawyers and researchers, have, have now dropped the, the, the conviction on the basis of common purpose. Almost eight years after the miraculous fall of apartheid, um, some of my clients take the stand before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we'll see them doing that. And the film may be a little bit confusing at times because it, it goes in and out of the, the present, the TRC present, and the apartheid past. And 18 years later, I returned to the New South Africa to meet with my clients for the first time since I had left in 1989 to explore with them their responses to the making of this film. And while I had witnessed the horrors of apartheid brutality <coughs> on ordinary lives from my time um, during this trial and the imposition of the death sentence, the torture, the solitary confinement, the social and political exclusion, the racism, the poverty. I was frankly ill-prepared for the manifestation of that legacy on my clients in South Africa today. But that enduring emotional and psychological damage from decades of cruel and inhuman treatment, the despair and harm that poverty and unmet expectations spawn, the spread of HIV AIDS, chilling increase in sexual violence is all now very prevalent, regrettably, in the New South Africa. Before we show the film, I want to just read, I think, what is a very powerful um, quote by Mrs. Grossa Michelle, the wife of former President Mandela, when she spoke at a peace lecture two years ago about apartheid and its enduring manifestation. She says, South Africa has not even begun to understand the deepest social crisis which has been structured, engineered, crafted, and systematically implemented along decades and decades by the apartheid system, precisely to break the social fabric of the nation so as to oppress and control the majority of the people. I don't believe that in 18 years of freedom, this nation has taken the time to seriously revisit what kind of psychological and emotional damage has been inflicted on the men and women of this society. Let's remember families have been torn apart for at least three generations. A significant number of parents in their 40s and 50s today grew up in torn, disrupted and dysfunctional families. I sincerely would think that we were mutilated and we are still in pain, we are hurting, we are bleeding and we are harming one another because we cannot control our pain. So sit back, relax. I'll see you after the movie for some discussion. Before we have t um, questions and answers, discussion, um, just maybe you probably heard there were 26, the number 26 mentioned. There were 26 originally arrested. Um, I only represented 25. We only represented 25 of the 26. The 26 accused was very smart. He got himself a lawyer that was very closely, um, thank you, Larissa. He was very closely um, related, connected to the prosecutor and he got um, um, convicted of public violence and a suspended sentence. My clients, of course, didn't want to. They did, legal aid was available to them. They wouldn't touch legal aid because it would save money. So, um, so that's the, the confusion possibly with the 2625. Just clear that up. Now, are there questions or comments? Or 
Okay, so in the longer version, you, you, you in the short, this is the short version of the movie. In the longer version of the movie, we, we explain mm. that um, on appeal, we were given what's called conditional leave to appeal. The same judge that heard the case, Justice Fasson, um, on conviction, on, on, on extenuation and mitigation of sentence was also the same judge that heard our request for leave to appeal. He refused us leave to appeal, surprise, surprise. And so what we had to do was petition the Chief Justice to appeal the case. And we got, as you hear me say, conditional leave to appeal. So we could only appeal 21 out of the 25 convictions of murder and all the death sentences. And so on the convictions, we argued about the incorrect application of the common purpose doctrine based on the facts. And the court was persuaded that it was an incorrect and erroneous application of the common purpose doctrine. And in relation to the, senti the death sentences, the, the case on extenuation, even though our clients wouldn't give evidence because they were consistent in their view that they were not on the scene, they said they had an alibi defense even though that they, they were on the scene, um, what we were able to persuade with the use of anthropological, psychological, forensic, you name it, sociological evidence, we built up these profiles, very extensive profiles of each accused. We were able to persuade the judges that there were extenuating factors such that the death penalty should not be applied. So you'll see that four, there were 14 sentences to death. Four, all the death sentences were commuted, overturned, but four of the 14 still served jail terms. The, the court held that they were more, the, the extent of their participation in the actual murder was greater than the others on the evidence of state witnesses. So, that they, so Justice Becker Becker, accused number one with the wonderful name of Justice, um, he's now a lawyer as you saw, he admits that he hit the man over the, the, uh, the deceased over the head with the rifle. There was a big contest in the trial about whether the hitting over the head of the rifle caused the death or whether the burning of the body caused the death by asphyxiation. And um, so justice is always going to never get away with anything but a prison term. Um, and before the TRC, he never, ever, ever, and I never wanted to really know as a defense lawyer, he, before the TRC was where he admitted to killing her. That was the first I ever knew about it. Um, and um, the other three were um, seen as encouraging the burning of the body and actually assaulting, state witnesses saw they saw them assault the body um, when it was hurled to the ground. So they were seen as the major perpetrators. There were sort of degrees of perpetration that persuaded them. They never, we gave them the opportunity. We had to, as their lawyers, we had to say, you have to change, the st you have to come clean, as it were. Tell us what happens. That's the only way we can save you from the death penalty. So we can show that you were provoked, or you were, as I say in the film, we, we, sh we need some defense around which we can build our extenuation. And there was a, we even threatened that we would bring Bishop Tutu and Mandela to talk to them, to persuade them. And there was such, there was a, there was a sort of breakage in the, in the group overnight. And then by morning, and I thought, oh good, some of them are going to come and tell me. By morning, <coughs> closed. And that common purpose was evident in this bonding. And it was unbelievable because Justice Becker Becker, his own brother, there were three sets of brothers that were arrested. And his own brother was, was also arrested and convicted of murder. And so we, I had a terrible time coming to terms with the fact that this man, who I adored and thought was incredible, actually pulled in a lot of people who weren't guilty. And, but they were so loyal to him throughout. There was such solidarity and such political solidarity that they wouldn't break. And they went to jail really on his behalf. But that was the nature of things. No, um, I had to get another lawyer in. We had to get a new team. It was a trial of new teams because after conviction, there was one lawyer, a guy called Andre Lundman, that, that represented all 25 to the point of conviction on a pro deo basis. The, the, the court appointed him because they 
um, and he was amazing, but he was exhausted. He ran a three-year trial, and then all his clients were convicted of murder. So he was exhausted, and that's when I got the phone call to say, can you come in and be the new lawyer to save, try and save these people from the death sentence? So I inherited this case, and, uh, and with it I inherited 12,000 pages of transcript. I'd never run a murder case before. I didn't know anything about the Common Purpose Doctrine. Most of the transcript was in Afrikaans. Never been to Uppington. And the judge convicted on the Friday and he wanted to sentence on the Monday. And I got the call on the Friday morning. And um, we had to get funding, US aid came to our aid and funded the case um, to get a postponement. And I said, we just got to get a postponement. And thank God the judge had planned a holiday and he wanted to clear his desk <coughs> for the holiday. And we said, why don't you go away and have a lovely holiday? <laughs> Take as long as you like. And we'll prepare some sort of meager little case for when you come back. And we actually, I had a fantastic barrister who agreed to do it with 24 hours notice and come and basically present a case for postponement. And um, so then we got, he, we got a lawyer just to do the postponement and then he left and then we got Anton was involved from the start, and then we got a senior lawyer, QC, Queen's Counsel, who was a guy called Ian Farlam, who very interestingly enough is the commissioner running the Marikana Mines Inquiry, where the common purpose doctrine is being, well, no longer applied. And then when Anton was assassinated, I brought in a two new young, uh, very qualified barristers, because we had no time, really, and we had to bring in a whole new team to run the appeal. Um, just on the Common Purpose Doctrine, Cecilia, if, if I can, um, what's interesting is that there was an inquest into Anton's death, and the judge that heard the inquest into his death found in South Africa, and it's very, or it was apartheid, South Africa was very Orwellian, and he found that there were a group of men who were members of what was called the Civil Cooperation Bureau, who were guilty of his murder. Twelve of them, they were security policemen, military guys, um, and he found that they had planned the Anton's murder and should be convicted on the basis of the Common Purpose Doctrine, which was a correct application <laughs> of the doctrine. Um, so history has a funny way of finding its way to truth. Um, you know, I have a, a real, I think because I'd been a political trial lawyer for quite a while before I took on this case, I had a real uh, skepticism about the media. I found most journalists extremely lazy especially when it came to, to court scenes. They, want, they would never read judgments properly and they wouldn't ever question and they just wanted to spin. So I was very nervous at the early stages of the case to open it up before I even knew the full extent of, of what was involved and understood the law enough to be able to articulate it simply for journalists. So I thought it was unwise to go to the media but I did pull, I had some very trusted journalist friends, and I did pull a couple of them in. One was John Battersby from the New York Times, um, and David Beresford, John Carlin from The Independent. I persuaded him, as he told me, you know, I said, you, but I want you to do an anthropological story about this. I want you to set the scene. Don't, don't litigate before we've even got to court on this. Just set the anthropological social scene about what, what happened. So I, I bided my time on that, and it was only when I really felt secure about my own knowledge that I felt we could go to the media. And it was an amazing thing, Ian. It was an amazing thing because, I mean, John's right that every Friday I would come to court with c collecting all the newspaper cuttings from around the world. And for the first time, the accused felt people know about us. You know, the case had gone on for years, and it was completely invisible. And had Anton and I not met at a conference, and had he not got a call from Mr. Gabula, and he'd phoned me, these guys would have just been sentenced to death, as you hear Justice and Maynard say in the beginning. No, the world wouldn't have known about it. They would have just, boom, sentenced to death, and possibly more even sentenced to death than 14, even though that's... Um, it was very difficult. You know, I had a lot of people approach... When I, I wrote a book about the case when I first got to Australia. It was almost a cathartic experience. And to make, I think the book was very much an, a, a conversation with myself about why I could leave a country that I so loved and adored and that had shaped me. 
and I needed to answer some questions for myself. And the book was also about validating the story for these people, giving them some historical record and um, paying tribute to them. Um, and so the book was, was a very important thing for me to do. Um, but I think the film, so a lot of people approached me to do a film, and many people wanted to do a feature film in Terebinsk with Hollywood romance and whatever, and I said no. And then I got approached by someone who wanted to do the film, and I said, well, who I trusted politically, and I said, you need to go back to South Africa and get the approval from my clients. They are the story. I'm simply the custodian of their story. They need to own the process with you if you're going to make a film. So we went back, the two of us, and he did 20 hours of footage, filmed these guys, and it was the first time I had met them in 18 years. And it was this unbelievably emotional, as you can imagine. And also, there was Justice, a lawyer, and then there was some of the others who were dying of HIV AIDS. There were others living in tin shacks, working in the, in the slaughterhouse, in the abattoir. Um, Evelina was very, very sick. Um, so there were some, Mena Bobu had become an anthropologist because he loved the anthropological expert in the trial and he decided he wanted to emulate him. Justice had become this lawyer because he wanted to follow in the, f take, he said, I want to wear Anton's shoes. I'm going to become a lawyer because I want to wear Anton's <laughs> shoes and <laughs> go into life as Anton would have. Um, so there were these amazing stories and we filmed it and, and when I came back I said to this, the filmmaker, please don't do a feature, I beg of you, because you cannot get anyone to play Justice Sokoboko. You can't. And these people are the story and so that's when he decided it was a documentary. And I think at that point, that journey was a very big healing thing. I think I dreaded going back. I was terrified to go back because at some level I felt I'd abandoned them and had turned my back on them and I've always wanted to try and let them know that I hadn't. But I, um, you know, I was grieving Anton's death. I was confused. I was, I was not in a good way. And um, the film has allowed me to kind of see myself as a character simply in a big story rather than be too invested. And that's been a huge healing for me, that I can step back from it instead of holding on to this thing. And um, Sophia and I have talked a lot about this, of, of <coughs> what, how it allowed me to, the film in a funny way has allowed me to make peace with, with my own internal sort of trauma around it. And um, also the, the great joy, um, the woman who took over the film the documentary is a, is a wonderful documentary filmmaker called Mitzi Goldman and I said you need to take the film back and get sign off from everybody Anton's family the accused everyone I won't come back with you it's your film you take it back and show and it was about to be screened at the Sydney Film Festival and I watched the accused and their families watching the film on Skype in Australia and Mitzi went 12 different screenings to different little shacks and houses around all the kids came to watch, saw their parents as these heroes. They'd never known about the story of these parents of theirs. Um, and everybody felt sort of acknowledged and honoured and validated. And for me, that was just, I can leave now. It's okay. They, I'm so pleased that they've, they've got some record of this and, and they've told their story. So that was the healing. But I have to say, you know, we had a hell of a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We laughed a lot. And we, it, it, that was also very important for me through that trial. It's a great question. We, um, you know, I took an, my lead from the Sharpful Six case, which had happened some years before, um, in finding Graham Tyson, the clinical the behavioral psychologist who was the individuation piece that had been accepted by the court. Um, and it was due to him. I said to him, we're, you know, we're in this terrible dilemma where we don't have people who will speak to what influenced their conduct on the day of the murder. So I, I can't just rely on a behavioral psychologist. I have to find, there, m there are other factors. There's poverty, there's racism, there's brutality by police. And so he introduced me to, I mean, I was a lawyer. What did I know about academics? Um, and so he introduced me to a number of amazing people and some of my colleagues um, from university days also were very helpful in me 
But you know, we, we, we did speak to people in America. We um, spoke, to, yeah, we did. We, we, we and, can, and Canadian experts, we got um, people on police brutality. We got, um, I can't even remember their names now, but I, I will. I remember phoning them, it was four in the morning for me, and I remember doing these long conference calls, um, getting their guidance on how to shape the evidence. We pulled in criminologists, sociologists, um, largely through um, reading court cases and who had been experts in court cases. Australia also had been enormously helpful because they had had what were known as the bikey murders, which were bike gangs killing one another. And um, so I drew on international literature, but we didn't, we couldn't afford to bring in an international expert. But there were amazing people around the world who came in and helped us and molded the evidence. Um, we got a forensic um, a medical guy also on the, the evidence on whether the smoke inhalation from the burning of the body could have killed as opposed to the hit over the head. So, all, you know, it was an amazing time. No, thank you for, I meant to mention mm -hmm. that in the beginning, very important question. So South Africa did have a jury system until the mid-60s. And then the Law Reform Commission in South Africa did a review on whether this was an appropriate thing to have because of the race question and um, decided no. And also people apparently didn't want to be on juries. So, <laughs> um, so, that, so we didn't have a jury system. And for, for this case, we had the judge had two assessors simply on the facts, not on law, um, but they had he'd sat with two assessors who would help him assess the facts, um, but there was no one on the extenuation or mitigation of sentence phase other than the judge just hearing it. So thank you for raising that. Um, yes, of course, um, I did, but you know, I don't know if you remember hearing and seeing them say that, that Setwala, Lucas Setwala, who was in his policeman who was killed, shot through a window and, and shot a little boy. And he actually paralyzed this little boy. And Justice was a male nurse at the time. And he was running away from, from this mad crowd, police and tear gas, with this crowd with him towards Setwala's house when he saw the boy being killed, um, being paralyzed, shot in the back. This little boy was just playing with a steel tire. And he got shot in the back and fell to the ground and was paralyzed. And his justice always said to me, something in my brain just snapped, the anger just, when I saw that. And so for him, I always believed there was, he, there was extenuation. But plus his life, which had been you know, brutalized by police, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing I did have difficulty with is that, that when I offered them the opportunity to come clean so that I could try and we could try and save them from the death penalty, justice had such a hold over the group that they all went down with him, in a sense, even his own brother. And I think, you know, we've never spoken about it, and we're very close, um, and they need to work it out for themselves. But in terms of my, my defense of him, I still feel it was, it was okay to defend him. But um, when Mitzi decided to make the film and asked to make the film, I said, you know, three things that I want from it. I, I promise you I won't be an intrusive character. There are three things I want from it. One, it has to have a very solid political sensibility. You need to show the politics of the place and the political tensions. And in the main film, you'll see the bigger film, the weaving of history in and out through our using archival and contemporary footage. I think we've done really well to do that. Secondly, you have to show that someone's son was brutally murdered. And you have to show Mrs. Setwala and you have to show her grief. I could never go there as a defense lawyer because it would have killed the defense. But you, the filmmaker, can do that. You have to give her, pay tribute to her in some way. And thirdly, I want a fantastic music score, which <laughs> we got. Yeah, no, that, that's an important point. Um, so Lucas Etwala, but Justice said they played soccer together, they were friends, they were neighbors. His father was... Lucas's father was Justice's father's closest friend. They were very connected. But, but South Africa and in that community, 
in such poverty, dire, dire poverty, and also police with were the, the level of brutality that we uncovered in that community is just unbelievable. Um, you know, people who would sell little stones to make some money would have their stones confiscated or bottles confiscated by the police. It was just like terrible cruelty and people being tortured and pulled off the streets and beaten up and for no reason other than because of the color of their skin. And Lucas Etwala came from a very poor family and his parents were quite ill and he, could, he managed to get a job as a policeman so he was seen as a betrayer. And as Justice says to the PRC, we have to have policemen, of course we do. But when they go against our interests as black people and our aspirations as black people, as black people, they are the enemy. And our brother became our enemy. And it was a, it was a terrible conflict for all of them, terrible, mm -hmm. that they had killed someone that had been their friend. None. Um, a woman, one of, the, one of the sisters of one of the accused was pregnant and a policeman stood on her stomach. And another, there was another young guy who tried to scale a wire fence and was impaled. The, 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 the carnage that night was unbelievable. I, I could not go near it. And, um, you know, that there's so many cases like that. Uh, and the Uppington case was just one of hundreds, maybe thousands yeah. of cases in South Africa like this. Um, but you just couldn't keep up with all the demands for justice. One just couldn't. So you had to prioritize. When Zulili Yona was tortured and forced to eat his own feces, and I did um, bring a civil claim for damages there, and we did get a little amount. But the others, we were facing the death sentence the next day. It was like and I, I said, I mean, you know, we said, should we try and find other lawyers to, and it was just, we just couldn't do it all. But, and most people didn't even, it didn't even enter their minds that they would ever get any justice, so why even bother trying? Hmm. And there's a terrible uh, uh, um, incident where Zulis Wayona, this little girl, mother, um, when I met her mother, her mother was pregnant with Innocentia. She called Innocentia, Innocentia is a symbol of her own innocence. Innocentia, when I met her, was being breastfed by her mother. And I said, you can't have your daughter in here because there's rats and lice. And so what I'll do is I'll take her home after court every day to her grandmother and bring her back in the morning and she can sit in the court. And um, Innocentia and I are now very close. Um, I put her through college and I've told her she has to be the Minister of Finance otherwise <laughs> there's trouble and she's done an accountancy degree and she's an amazing amazing young woman um, and you know I think there's so many people that want that want justice but and she always felt that she should have done something and we used to talk about it but there's no it just didn't enter their minds that that you can do that um, there is just such an in a disempowerment of those people. It feels exciting to me at some level, you know, it does. Um, there's an amazing energy, there's a new whole new life that people have discovered for themselves. But um, I think the notion of governing is, uh, is something that is very, it's been an excluded experience for the majority of the people there. And most of the people who govern were in exile and had no experience of good governance or governing. So they've come back into a situation, except for a few people who, and, and there's a real lack of good governance in the country on, on not just political level, but in every level, health, education. But I think there's so many competing demands on the government. You know, it's like the expectation from the 94 elections was that everyone was going to get a house, electricity, water, education. And, and to rearrange and restructure that level of structural inequality is a massive undertaking. And so I think to hold the country and the government responsible for such a, a failure, which there is, a massive failure, uh, um, and after 20 years, one would think, hello, but it's not easy. 
to, to restructure a whole country. And so I have some sympathy for that, even though I have no sympathy for the corruption and the nepotism and the violence. But on the violence, you know, people, people say to me, God, South Africa is so violent. And, but, you know, apartheid was the most violent system. And people forget that it's going to take generations for the toxins of that violence to really get out of everybody's system. Um, and so the Marikana mines thing, for me, I could understand how that could happen. But the police are inept. They know only that you treat violence with violence. That's their life. That's been their life history. And so you could see what happened, um, how it could happen. So at one level, I think it's amazing. When I go back to the law school at the University of Cape Town and see all these amazing, diverse students, it's so exciting. Um, and these diverse cultures and and ro the literature that's coming out of the country, the art, the music, the theatre, that's, that's fantastically wonderful. The lawyering mm. that's going on there is wonderful. But Edwin Cameron, a judge on the Constitutional Court, recently gave an interview where he said, we are way behind where we should be. And he's right. But it's, I don't like to say that because I live outside of the country and I feel like I'm just looking in and being critical, but I, I, it doesn't, it's not, it's unsettling to go back. Is that one of the reasons why you left? I left, no, I left, I left just shortly after Anton was assassinated in 89, so I've been out the country 25 years. You but left because of the violence and... I left because I was under threat myself and um, with every intention of going back and then I didn't. I went back to do the appeal and by then I sort of had a life in Australia and but I go back a lot, and the film has taken me back wonderfully. It's shown at a number of festivals in, and in South Africa as well, and um, um, the South African one has been interesting. Um, it's, sh it's shown in England, it's shown in Mexico of all places, and um, you know, I've had really, the international response is fantastic. Um, in South Africa, it's shown on national television twice, and I always know when it's shown because I get these emails from people I've never heard of, hundreds of emails just saying, you know, thank you and amazing or terrible or whatever. Um, but the experience I've had when I've gone back with it to show at film festivals there is um, people are really pleased that the film was made because people forget. People, young, the... There's a new generation called the Born Free Generation. This is the new generation of children and ad young adults. That they ca they're called the Born Free Generation. They have no understanding of apartheid. No understanding. And so they, their parents are very pleased. They tell me, I get these emails saying, thank you, because our children need to know what we went through and what we struggled for. For them, it's just like life's so different. Not for all of them, I mean, not for the very poor and the excluded and the marginalised, but so generally there's a, there's a really, really good response um, to it for that reason. Yeah. There have been some criticisms and, you know. <laughs> That's a good answer. You know, I didn't expect anything. In fact, I was terrified <laughs> to take it back there. It's fine showing it here and it's fine showing it in Australia and London and... But to take it back ho to home and show it to your home audience is bloody terrifying. And I used to sort of sit in the back under a, in a cupboard <laughs> and <laughs> hating every minute of it. And then I was so relieved when people said, thank you for doing the film. You know, and thank you for... Because uh, I also resisted the film for a long time. Just yeah. resisted doing it. So what no, no, she's Australian, oh. which is amazing. Um, and the reason that she, she did a wonderful film called Hatred, which is about racism. And um, so I like, she, uh, initially the guy that I went back to South Africa with, the filmmaker, who was going to do the feature, and then we decided to turn it, he said, I'm not a documentary filmmaker. So he approached Misty as a documentary filmmaker and said, would you make it with me? And she saw the footage and read the book and said, I don't want to make it with you, I want to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so goodbye. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing it. A great pleasure.